I'm Steve Damaris. I'm the Dale Arner Distinguished Professor of Wildlife Management at Mississippi State University. We're here to answer important questions that hunters, land managers, and agencies have about deer populations and their habitat. I think we are the premier white-tailed deer research unit in North America. My name is Dan Marina and I'm a research assistant graduate student here at Mississippi State University. I grew up hunting and fishing in North Carolina. Went to NC State University, got my wildlife degree. I got in contact with Dr. Damaris here at Mississippi State. Wound up getting this position here, and I've been here doing my research ever since. So my job out here is to manage all aspects of everything that goes on out here, and mainly that's all the hands-on work. So that's from going out in the field and capturing wild animals to planning and implementing all of our research activities that happen out here. Some of the research that is being done out here, it's a lot of stuff that's never been done before, and a lot of what we're doing here will help make you a better gamekeeper. Throughout the southeast there's a huge range in breeding dates of white-tailed deer. Breeding dates affect behavior of bucks. Hunters want to hunt bucks during the breeding season. So management agencies need to know when deer are breeding. The way you find out about breeding season is sampling the does after they've been bred and, and aging the fetuses that are within them. To estimate how old a fetus is, you need a fetal growth curve or a scale. That curve allows us to determine when those does bred in that population, giving us knowledge of when the rut is occurring in different populations. And so what we found here in Mississippi was that curve was not accurate in certain parts of our state. So all this research that we're doing ultimately will lead to more knowledge for the biologists in your area to improve the deer seasons uh, where you live and to also give you more information on when's the best time to be out in the woods hunting. And you want that information to be the most accurate so that you can make the best decision on when to go. In order to have a known age fetus, you have to control or know when a doe breeds. So in order to do that, we've been inserting what we call cedars to control the timing of estrus. This here is a cedar. This is what we're going to be using to uh, synchronize estrus. Uh, it's just a little uh, device that goes inside the doe, releases progesterone for two weeks, and when we pull it out, within 24 to 48 hours, they go into estrus. parked up on this side? Uh, yes, let's put it push it down. Right, cool. park up uh, just kind of right, just past that dead tree, and then yep. angle down this direction so they come all into this corner we can dart. Okay. okay, let us get up, we'll go ahead and get up in the blind, get set up, and then I'll radio you to go ahead and get set up in position for pushing. Sounds good. All right guys, we're ready to go. So we've got a lot of deer in this pen and we only need one particular doe because we're actually scheduling each individual doe in these pens to be synchronized. So um, it's going to take a little bit, we've got to identify which one we're after and then we'll go ahead and get a dart in there. As soon as she stops, I'm going to shoot her. Stay right where you are. We're gonna let her go down back in this back corner. Ten four. She's getting a little little weak legged and Hopefully soon she'll be going down. She was born in 2007, so she is nine and a half years old. She is a second generation doe. Okay, she is down. So now we're gonna have them come back over to us. We're gonna let the rest of the deer move up to the top of the pins and we'll go ahead and get her on a, on a gurney. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and insert her cedar. Okay, now 
we'll give her her antibiotic, which we give all of our deer every time we dart. Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. After after all those drugs that she just reverses that quickly and they're back up on their feet. This is why we've switched to this drug. It just lowers the chance of them being run over by cars because they're drowsy or killed by predators. So it's amazing. We're gonna leave that cedar in her for two weeks and then two weeks from now we're gonna dart her again. Go ahead and move her into the trial pen where she'll stay for uh, 48 hours during the trial and then she'll be moved out to breed with our breeder bugs. This one research project that's designed to answer the fetal growth curve question for the state agency allows us to also address this really cool ecology, deer ecology question. Why do bucks have antlers? Why do they invest so much into growing these large antlers? We know that antlers are used as a defense mechanism to fight other bucks and to establish dominance. But antlers are an important predictor of genetic quality, we think. It should matter to the female who she breeds. So for our first set of trials, we're actually going to get two bucks that are the same age, same body size. One will have large antlers, one will have small antlers. And then we're gonna put them in pens that are adjacent to a center pen where that doe that's going to be into estrus is going to be placed. So ultimately, our goal is to find out if what is on that deer's head is going to influence who she chooses. <laughs> doing is installing the, the antlers uh, for the choice trials. We're going to install a large set of antlers on one of the bucks and a small set of antlers on the other and both bucks are comparable size and same age so this will allow us to uh, just look at and isolate antlers uh, as far as female choice in these trials. And at the same time while we're doing all of that uh, we're actually giving them their annual workup and so what we do is all of our bucks and our pens we remove their antlers each year about this time after the velvet sheds. Uh, one, to protect themselves so they don't hurt each other in the pen uh, when they're fighting, and then also to, to pre kind of preserve our um, facility here so they don't tear it up too much. In 60 to 70 years of white-tailed deer research, no one has ever tested to see if white-tails or any other deer species throughout the world actually has a preference on which buck she gets bred by. And that's exactly what we're trying to answer with Dan's research. In addition to the fetal growth curve, while we have an estrus doe, we can see if she has a preference on what kind of buck she is bred by. We'll carry them outside the door. I don't want to have to drive in there, so we'll just carry them right outside on the gurney, weigh them, do right, all the stuff Right, but you want there. me to stay out until you're done darting, I would assume, right? Yes. You don't want me driving through. Right. Okay. All right. So while we're doing all these activities and when we go in to dart our deer, the number one priority is the animal and, and its safety. And so we time our dartings and we time all our activities out here in the pen, uh, times that it's cooler, uh, typically earlier in the morning. We're constantly monitoring their temperatures, respiratory rate, and other vital signs just to make sure that these deer are not getting overheated, they're not overly stressed, and that the health of that animal is being taken care of the whole time. So the major aspect of this study is installing and manipulating antler size on these bucks. These devices that we're using were devised by Dr. Maris and it's never been done before. Now if you'll notice, you look at these bolts that I've got here and I said through bolts, those bolts go through the bone, through the antler and not through the skull. So when the deer normally shed their antlers, they will also shed these base couplings and then we just go out in the field and find them all and we can reuse them. And now we're gonna install the small set of antlers on this deer. 
we found through our past field season that this method of attachment really is, is very strong and allows these deer to keep these antlers on their head for the duration of our study. Now to finish them up, we go with a, a bone colored duct tape. And that's so when the doe goes in, she doesn't necessarily notice a big metal coupling on his head. Now he's ready to go. We've got his uh, new set of antlers on him. Unfortunately, they're smaller than what he had. You know, this is, this is what he had. Now he's shrunk down to about this size, but this is a good size for us to compare. It's relatively small, so we can compare it to a large set of antlers. So now we're ready to go ahead and put him back in the pen, and we'll go ahead and work up our next buck for the large antlers. Dominant bucks are not necessarily dominant because they have bigger antlers. Antlers explains about 30% of the, the variation in breeding success. Body size explains another 30% or so. So that leaves about 40% that probably comes down to attitude of the buck. Now we're interested in the question of what kind of sire does the female prefer. been shown in small mammals that if the female gets to be bred by her preferred sire, she actually produces more young that survive better. And so it, it does matter to a female who she's bred by. Large antler buck. We just installed these large antlers on him. You can see his antlers. You know he, he's a pretty impressive deer already, but uh, the mass on this one is a little bit thicker and got nicer, you know, bigger brow tines. He's going to be our large deer in the choice trial uh, compared to what you saw earlier. These are a whole lot larger and just kind of a good average large size buck. We're going to have him go into. We're going to reverse him now and put him up into his pen, and he'll be on the other side of the choice trial. <laughs> excited about the choice study. In reality, the doe is going to, when she's in estrus, she's going to be bred by whichever buck is behind her. And it's among the bucks to determine who's behind her. So that's why this project doesn't necessarily have a lot of practical management application, but it's a really cool ecological question. It has to matter to the female who she's bred to. And so we're really leading ecological research that complements the many years of applied research that we've done. So once we have these deer in the trials, that's where the real work begins. Uh, we have 24 hour live cameras facing down each fence line between the doe and, and where these bucks are. And then it's my responsibility to go through these videos and tease out how much time she's spending on either side and if she's performing any type of behavior that would indicate her choice for each buck. Uh, you can see in this video here, um, the doe comes into, this, into the frame. Uh, so she's now within 10 feet of that fence line, so we would be recording this as time she spent walking. But then as that buck approaches, um, what we're looking for is how is she reacting? And a lot of the times she may be standing there um, and when the buck approaches, she may take off. Right now we wouldn't say she's behaving in a way that would indicate choice, but as I fast forward 
and we get to a point here, this doe is now turned around with her back facing the fence, allowing that buck to sniff and lick her, and she stands in this posture for over a minute. And so this would be the type of behavior that we would say is indicating choice. So in doing these trials, we understand that there can be other factors influencing where the doe is in relation to these other bucks that we put beside her. But we try to do everything we can to control for those factors. We take the bucks and after several sets of trials that go through, we'll switch the bucks to opposite sides of that pen to make sure there's not some pen effect where the does are just liking one side of the pen versus another. Another thing we do is we'll take the antlers and we'll take the large set and the small set and swap them between the bucks just to make sure that there's not some other aspect about that buck that those are queuing in on and instead we're seeing if they're going to follow the antlers wherever they go. All right so now that we've finished up these antler choice trials um, what we found was that females chose larger antler bucks over smaller antler bucks uh, 13 out of 15 trials and so what this means is that antlers can not only be used as weapons uh, for males to fight in male-to-male -male combat for access to these females but they can also be used as uh, what we call as ornaments or a signal of phenotypic quality that these females may choose so that their offspring would gain benefits in, in more dominance and, and better reproductive success, ultimately passing on more of that female's genes and increasing her fitness. We're really excited about the CHOICE study, not because it's going to change management per se. We're going to look at does a female prefer a bigger antlered buck, an older buck, or a bigger bodied buck, and if so, why? And, and that's going to show the world that Mississippi State University is a leader, not in just applied management research, but also deer ecology research.